Good evening, everyone. My name is Shakela Alvarenga. I am the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's program, Wrongful Convictions, DNA, and the Innocence Project. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, more than 3,000 people have been exonerated since 1989. 375 of those individuals were exonerated by DNA testing, and tonight you will meet one of them. It is an honor to introduce our panelists for tonight's event. Uh, Anton Robinson is a senior staff attorney in the Innocence Project's strategic litigation department, focusing on mistaken identification cases. Before joining the Innocence Project, Robinson was a senior planner at the Vera Institute of Justice, where he launched and managed the New York City Bail Assessment Project to mitigate the harms of money bail. Before the Vera Institute, Robinson worked as an assistant public defender at the New York County Defender Services, representing persons facing criminal charges in Manhattan criminal and Supreme Courts. He currently teaches wrongful convictions at American University Washington College of Law. And to my left is Marvin Anderson, wrongly convicted of the 1982 rape and robbery of a woman based on her identification and the prosecution's concealment of exculpatory evidence. Anderson was the first person exonerated under a new Virginia law allowing uh, DNA evidence to supersede Virginia's 21-day rule for the introduction of new evidence. Anderson was convicted solely on the eyewitness testimony of the victim. He was paroled in 1997 after 15 years in prison. Anderson was cleared of the crime by DNA testing four years later. He was granted a full pardon by Virginia Governor Mark Warner on August 21st, 2002. Please give both of our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So before we hear from Marvin Anderson about his experience in the criminal justice system, Anton Robinson will give just a brief overview of the Innocence Project and Marvin Anderson's case, and then we'll take questions from the audience at the end of the program. Anton. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for having me here tonight. Um, such an important opportunity to talk about wrongful convictions is something that I do as a part of my job. And I got to say how proud I am to be sitting next to this gentleman, uh, someone who has told me and taught me a lot about wrongful convictions, uh, someone who is a member of our board at the Innocence Project, who guides our work um, and, and uh, encourages us uh, to move in, in specific ways um, with the goal of, of limiting wrongful convictions and preventing wrongful convictions. So, I'm excited to be here tonight. Uh, I'm glad you all showed up. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here. Um, so I'm Anton Robinson. I am a senior staff attorney at The Innocence Project, and uh, I work on our uh, strategic litigation team. And what that means is I work primarily through the criminal courts um, with the goal of preventing wrongful conviction. So, um, I file a lot of amicus briefs. Anybody know what amicus briefs? Anybody want to yell it out? Friend of the court briefs. I think I did not hear it out there. You didn't know this was <laughs> call and response, right? Um, but friend of the court briefs with the goal of laying out to the court very, um, you know, sometimes complex scientific arguments that we need to make. Um, you know, complex legal arguments that we need to make with the goal of educating judges um, and other system actors who are analyzing in cases. Um, the goal for us is to, as an organization, um, is to prevent wrongful convictions, of course, to free the innocent, and to create equitable systems of justice for everyone. Um, and as we get a little bit you know, more into this conversation, we will talk about racial justice and racial bias and how that shows up in many cases. Um, a lot of the experience that I bring to this work comes from me being a public defender for 
um, about eight, nine years. I started out in Orlando, Florida. Um, my home state is Florida. Um, and also worked in, in New York City. I have represented thousands and thousands of people. And, you know, there is nothing more sobering than to stand next to someone who you genuinely believe, based upon everything that you know about their cases, or about their case, um, that they are not guilty, and to see a jury return a guilty verdict. And so I am proud to be uh, an, an attorney at the, the Innocence Project uh, to help work on these issues and to help free the innocent. Um, let's see. You know, some of the work that we do at IP is, and I've already shortened it, the, our name with you all, so that means I like you all. <laughs> um, at the Innocence Project, um, we uh, have an incredible policy department that works on uh, bills and to ensure that we're preventing wrongful convictions. We have um, a science and research department that continues to keep us on our toes and continue to allow us to challenge courts to recognize valid science. Um, and we are often, uh, you know, what I love about the Innocence Project is we have the opportunity to do work, really nerdy work behind a desk, but we also get to get out there and rally, uh, which I'm sure some of you all have been at, at various rallies. Um, these are the gentlemen who began uh, the Innocence Project, um, Peter Newfield and Barry Sheck, um, you know, legal titans. But in uh, 1992, when the Innocence Project was uh, a very, very new thing, uh, we, the, the idea was very, very different, right? DNA evidence uh, was being used to prosecute people. And what these two uh, legal visionaries realized was that we could use DNA to exonerate folks. And that led to a different way of looking at how to apply DNA evidence. Um, the Marion Coakley case was one that involved uh, sexual assault, uh, happened in the Bronx, New York. And Mr. Coakley was charged with a crime that he simply did not commit. And while the, the DNA structure was not, uh, or, or science rather, was not at a stage that it could be used to exonerate him at that time, there was other evidence that um, these two gentlemen and their students used to exonerate Mr. Coakley. Um, it certainly was the impetus for what later became the Innocence Project and we use the evidence um, from that case. We learned how to harness uh, DNA evidence to exonerate folks. And so that is what we uh, have, have used at the Innocence Project. Um, we continue to do so. Um, and what I find very, very interesting about the use of DNA in cases is we have seen, and this is sort of getting to us to the racial justice piece a little early, is we have seen a vast drop in the amount of sexual assault cases that involve black men and white women, primarily because of the use of DNA evidence in these cases. That is, now that DNA uh, is being scrutinized in a different way and being introduced in cases at all, it is the, the incidence of wrongful convictions involving black men and white women have reduced vastly um, by more than around 50%. And what that tells us is the power of DNA evidence, but it also tells us about the ways in which the criminal legal system worked prior to our ability to harness DNA evidence to, to exonerate people. And what you see here is just a, a timeline of, of um, DNA exonerations in uh, between 1989 and 2017. I want to, and I wrote this down because I want to get these numbers right, but I want to talk a little bit about something, uh, a few things that we found at the Innocence Project in 30 years 
Um, we were founded in 1992, so we are celebrating 30 years in the game. And what we found uh, in, in those 30 years from reviewing the first 375 DNA exonerations, okay? So out of the first 375 DNA exonerations, um, the, the folks spent approximately 14 years 14 years was the average amount of time that people spent in prison for crimes that they did not commit. It's a total of about 5,280 total years in prison for crimes that people did not commit. <clears throat> about 21 of the 357 um, people served time on death row. No, sorry, 375, served time on death row. And so this meant that, that approximately 21 people were potentially going to be executed by the state before they were exonerated. Now, 70% of these cases involved eyewitness misidentification. Uh, that's an area that I work on a, a lot, I have a lot of briefs in that area. Um, there is a lot of social science that judges um, and other system actors, prosecutors, defense attorneys even, don't know some of this social science. Um, the ways in which we make identifications of people, um, the, the um, factors called estimator variables um, that impact our ability to make identifications, all of these are relevant and, and many of the people who are doing this work every day um, are not as aware of it as they should. But 70% of these cases involved eyewitness misidentification. Now I want to talk a little bit more about racial justice. Of the 375 first DNA exonerations, 225 were black people, about 60% in a world where black people, in a country rather, where black people make up about 13% of the population. About 117 were white people, and about 29 uh, or 8% were Latinx. 165 of the cases, in 165 of the cases, the person who actually committed the crime um, was later identified but not before they committed additional crimes. And so this tells us that we really have to think about our system of justice uh, and ways to make it more equitable, ways to prevent people like Mr. Anderson here from being wrongfully convicted and so that is why I'm so grateful to have you all here to, to discuss these issues. Now, I am going to try my best, <laughs> Mr. Anderson. And he keeps telling me to call him Marvin, but I just can't do it yet. <laughs> um, I'm going to try my best to tell a little bit of Mr. Anderson's story in as much as it relates to many of the issues that I work on every day. I was not the attorney in Mr. Anderson's case. Um, but I want to take you back to the summer of 1982. Um, just outside of Richmond, Virginia. This gentleman was about 18 years old at the time. And he had goals of being a firefighter. He worked at a, an amusement park. He had a long-time girlfriend. His life was, was, he was set. And that all came crashing down in the summer of 1982 when he was accused of sexual assault and rape. Now, the reason that Mr. Anderson became a suspect was not because of some uh, you know, unique or um, detailed uh, investigation, it was because one of the officers recognized that Mr. Anderson was one of the, the few black men, and I got to say black boys, you were, mm -hmm. you were a boy at the time, 
who was dating a white girl. And that set off alarm bells in the officer's mind, presumably, and it led them to Mr. Anderson. And because Mr. Anderson had no prior criminal record whatsoever, there was not a photo to show to the complaining witness or the victim. And so what the officers, the investigating officers did was they went to that amusement park that that Marvin worked at, and they got his a photo from his, his badge, his ID. And they used that in the identification procedure. So we call it uh, an ID world, um, an eyewitness identification world, we call it a six pack. Um, but it's a photo array procedure, and typically there is the image of uh, the suspect, along with five other images of people who um, who look like the suspect. In this six-pack, six Mr. Anderson's photo was very, very different from the other photos in the six-pack. So there were five photos that were in black and white, and one photo that was in brilliant color. That photo from his work badge. So, what we call it in eyewitness identification world is suggestive identification procedures. What that means is that one of the photos stands out over all of the others, creating suggestion, making it easy for a witness to pinpoint someone, or a victim to pinpoint someone to say, this is the person who did it. And I, and I gotta tell you that you know, out of all of the identification procedures I've heard of, this is one of the most suggestive. So naturally, the complainant picked out Mr. Anderson's photo. Now, I said I was going to do this, so I'm going to turn it over to you, <laughs> because that was not the only identification procedure. It's pretty common in many cases for there to be other identification procedures, we can talk later about why that, some of that is not scientifically defensible. Um, but I do want to toss it to Mr. Anderson uh, now to talk a little bit more about um, what happened at the next identification procedure. So I'm going to toss it to you, my friend. Thank you, Anton. Let's think back, 1982, 18 years old, young black male um, dating a white woman. At that time, I lived in a small community. Um, interracial dating was not really known in the, 82, in the 80s. So when this happened, um, the officer that Anton mentioned, it was a black officer that knew me. He knew my family. Not only that, I have gone to this man's house and ate dinner with him at his kitchen table. So he knew me. Well, he appeared at my job, and they had the, my job ID. And he started questioning me, you know, where was you at on Saturday afternoon, such and such time? I told him an honest answer. I could have been anywhere. I'm only 18 years old. Kids be anywhere. <laughs> so. He asked me right then, would you be willing to take a polygraph test? Once again, I had nothing to hide. I agreed to do so. But in order for me to take a polygraph test, I had to go down to lockup. I agreed to do so. We go down to county lockup. However, before we go to the county lockup, they stop by the victim's apartment. I had just saw my ID picture on the desk when I walked into the office to be questioned. I saw him get out of the car with my picture and goes into the victim's apartment. They leave the victim's apartment, takes me down to county lockup. Within 10 minutes of me arriving at county lockup, the victim shows up. We had a lineup, okay, that was other inmates and myself. We all were dressed in a green jumpsuit. The victim walked in, she looked at everyone, she walked out. She comes back into the room, looks at everyone again, 
and she walks out. The officer comes into the room, and he dismissed the other inmates, and I'm standing there by myself, and he just looks at me. At that moment, I knew I was going to prison. I looked at him, I said, she picked me. He said, how did you know? I said, I know she picked me. And that's when he informed me that she did identify me as her accuser. Now here's the worst part of this whole lineup, photo spread. The actual perpetrator was in that live lineup. Mm. Yes. He was in the same lineup but yet she identified me. Now, <clears throat> I always tell people when I talk about my story is this. She was a victim. What happened to her was real. But any person that goes through that much trauma at one moment, and you are shown a picture of the same individual over and over and over again, and you see that same person, from that picture within 10 minutes of time, you gonna remember that person. And that's what happened with me. <clears throat> In December, I went to trial. The only evidence that the Commonwealth said he had was the victim identification. The female got off the stand, she testified that her attacker was a very light-skinned and complexion person straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face, and short, kinky hair. In 1982, I had waves in my head. In 1982, if you see me close enough, I still have a scar in the middle of my forehead that I received ice skating. Mm -hmm. In 1982, I had a chip front tooth, but yet the victim, sir, her accuser, was a straight, light-skinned, very light-skinned, complexion person, with straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. During my trial, the victim testified that what happened to her, word for word. And the whole time all of this is going over, I'm looking over at the jury. My jury consisted of eight women, four men, all white. And the look they gave me, once again, I knew I was going to prison. My trial lasted less than three and a half hours. They came back with a guilty verdict. Gave me a sentence of 210 years. At that moment, I turned around to look at my mother, who was sitting directly behind me, and I could not see her. After I was shackled, handcuffed, shackled, and taken out of the courtroom, my family was on the outside of the courtroom, and they saw the Commonwealth attorney. And his words to my mother was this, we knew your son did not commit the crime, but it was up to your lawyer to prove it. And I spent 15 years of my life in prison but something I did not do. Now, we're going to go back to DNA. Mr. Anton already mentioned DNA evidence. Through all my court procedures, following appeals and everything, the court system always said that my evidence had been destroyed. They could not find it. Now, we knew that the judge did not order the evidence to be destroyed. We knew that I didn't have the evidence. I'm locked up. I can't have it. Towards the end of the Innocent Project, I'm about to close my caseload. I had one lawyer who was a student lawyer. She begged and pleaded, Mr. Newfell and Sheck, don't close this caseload. There has to be evidence somewhere. They called back down to Virginia Forensic Office and they asked to do another research through everything, and they found my DNA evidence. The Dr. Mary Jane Burton, whatever caseload came across her desk, she kept samples of it. 
It ran the test. DNA evidence came back and excluded me from the charges. Not only did it exclude me, but it made our governor go back to all her caseloads to look at to see what was in there. Just from my case alone, there has been 12 other people in the state of Virginia who has been exonerated because of DNA evidence. You want to take it from there? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I'll just chime in really quickly, Marvin. Sure. Thank you. Um, can you explain to the audience, too, just a little bit about your journey through the you know, criminal justice system after you were convicted 15 years in prison? What was that like for you? My mother could never understand when she's come visit me that I would tell her that I had a switch that I would turn on and off. Um, when, they, when my family came to visit me, that light switch would be turned on. Happy times, happy moments. But once they left, I turned that switch off. It's two different worlds that we live in. Two different worlds. And in order for me to survive, survive inside, I couldn't think about what my family is doing on the outside. If I did that, I would have been just another prey. I would have been a victim myself. It's two different worlds. I had to question my faith many times. And I was, um, grew up in the church, believing in the Lord, praise him every day. But I questioned that every day. Why me? And I can always go back to my grandmother would always say, you know, God have a reason for everything. We may not know what that reason may be, but he has a reason for everything. And even to this day, I, I think about her words, and I see her words, and I see what God had for me. My evidence was found, DNA was tested, proved my innocence, and for the last 20, over 25 years, I've been on this journey to help change this justice system that I had a state senator said that there's nothing wrong with our justice system, it's fine. No, it's broken. It's been broken for many years, so. How did you hear about the Innocence Project and their work with, with DNA? Um, while I was incarcerated, I had a, a jailer um, approach me and, and say, hey man, you know, you know, I keep hearing you say that you're innocent, you don't belong here, and maybe you might, might wanna write this organization. Well, a few days later, I had a counselor approached me with the same thing, you know. You might want to write this organization and they do nonprofit work and all of this. And I did. I wrote a letter to the Innocent Project. Um, it took a while, but they responded back, said they would accept my case. And they did. And like I said, the whole 15 years, they never um, swayed from my case, you know. Um, and even today, it's mostly law students that be working on these cases. You know, these are, these are students that are trying to become a lawyer. And this one student, she refused to give up on me. Yeah. How did you find out that you were exonerated? Tell us <laughs> about that moment. Yeah, I could like this one. <laughs> <laughs> I had already been out on parole in 19, I got on parole in 1997. And in 2000, um, I'm driving my uncle's tractor trailer. You know, this is during rush hour traffic and everything. And I get a phone call from Mr. Newfield. He go, hey Marvin, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good, sir, how you doing? He said, I have some good news. I said, okay, what's the good news? He said, we found your evidence. 
I'm like, huh? He said, yeah, we found your evidence. I said, Mr. Newfield, what does that mean? He said, well, we had tests done, and it had excluded you from being the perpetrator. And I go, Mr. Newfield, wait a minute, wait a minute, sir, please wait. I'm in rush hour traffic in the afternoon, driving an 18-wheeler track trailer. <laughs> Let me just pull over to the side of the road. So I pulled over to the side of the road, and I get out the truck, and I'm walking about you know, 20 to 30 feet in front of the truck, and I just started dancing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and cars and everything going by me, they blowing their horn, and <laughs> they have no idea why I'm dancing, but I'm dancing. So I finally get home, and then I, I call Mr. Newfield, and uh, he explained everything to me, that they went back to the um, forensic lab, went through the archives, and they found the perk kick, the original perk kick from my caseload in 82. And they had DNA testing ran, and it excluded me from being a perpetrator. And listen to this now. It excluded me from being a perpetrator. You remember when I said that the real perpetrator was in my lineup? The DNA matched him. Not only that, I wasn't able to tell you this part, but during my trial, the real perpetrator was supposed to be a witness in my trial. All we wanted was to have him take the stand so the victim could see him and hear his voice. My lawyer refused to put him on the stand. Not only that, in 1986, while I was already incarcerated, the real perpetrator wrote letters to the judge and explained to him that it wasn't me that committed the crime, that he had committed the crime. We brought the real perpetrator back to court on our appeal, had him testify. He testified word for word to what the victim testified to, and the court system refused to believe his testimony, and I went back to prison. But when the DNA testing was done, it excluded me and matched him as the crime of that crime. And once I was exonerated, um, he did go to trial. He received two life sentences in 40 years, so. Now, DNA fingerprinting was first used in a police forensic test in the late 1980s, and Anton, maybe this is mm -hmm. where you can uh, chime in here sure. to just explain how DNA has sort of just revolutionized criminal investigations like Mr. Anderson's. Sure, so, so prior to the sort of prolific use of DNA, there was very limited ability to test, uh, you know, tissues and, uh, and blood samples, for example. Um, we, you know, a lot of the analysis prior to that time was looking at um, blood types, right? But what the DNA technology did, we all have different DNA except for um, identical twins, right? So we all have our own fingerprint. That's, that's where that sort of term comes from. What the technology, to, to simplify it, is like what the technology did was to create, a, a, you only needed very, very tiny amounts of DNA evidence. It replicated um, this, this chain, this protein chain. Um, and what we were able to do is now we were able to, you know, throughout the 90s, and you saw when we got the sort of boom of DNA um, exonerations, we were able to use smaller samples, samples that had been degraded in a different way, whereas early on in the use of the technology, you needed much larger samples. Uh, and so it, that in and of itself is what revolutionized the use of DNA evidence um, in cases is that we were now able to not only figure out the source of cells and, and uh, that you know, an investigator locates at a crime scene, but you were also able to exclude people as a contributor of that DNA sample. Uh, and so, so that in and of itself is, is what has revolutionized the way that we, um, you know, use DNA evidence in, in criminal cases. And now there are some challenges, or I should say limitations of 
forensic DNA evidence. And so can you explain some of the disadvantages too? There is research that suggests that it can actually contribute to miscarriages of justice as well. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it really depends upon, uh, well, one of the things is, is how DNA is being maintained um, and how it is uh, used in separate, in different cases. Um, and as well as, um, you know, knowing that uh, in many instances, that evidence, in some instances, that evidence is, is never even handed over to the appropriate people who need it. And so defense attorneys have limited opportunities to test the DNA evidence that is, is present and available. Um, and then there's also uh, some more complex issues with, with the mixture of DNA. Uh, there are some samples that, you know, so I'll give an example from some of the cases that I've handled is you know, the suggestion that um, a person's DNA is in a place sometimes sends off flags to prosecutors or other people investigating cases that a person might have been present. Um, but very, very small uh, amounts of DNA can be in places. It's called touch DNA. Um, so DNA that passes from cells. I mean, anytime I touch uh, my clothing or any other place, my, I can leave DNA there. And so I've had various cases where I was told up and down by investigators that uh, my client was in a specific place at a specific time, which DNA can never tell us when the person was there. Uh, and so uh, many of those cases turned into uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of investigation um, to make it very clear that my client was not the person who was present at the time, was not the, the uh, you know, was not present at the time that the crime was committed, even if their DNA or their, you know, samples of their skin cells were present at, at um, the, the scene. Now, we've talked about a few contributing causes with Marvin uh, Anderson's case, eyewitness misidentification, government misconduct, and inadequate defense. Can you elaborate a little bit more about some of some other, I should say, causes of wrongful convictions? Mm -hmm. So one other one is false confessions. And I was talking to Mr. Anderson today, like obviously that was not an issue in his case. He maintained his innocence the entire time. But you would be surprised to know that many people plead guilty to crimes that they have not committed and that the evidence comes back, DNA evidence or otherwise, comes back and shows that they were not the person who committed this crime. And so what that tells us is the circumstances with which um, confessions are garnered is important, they're important for us to, to look at, to litigate for defenders in the house, um, and to acknowledge that, that you know, compulsion, uh, and different levels of compulsion uh, may cause a person to plead guilty um, or to confess to a crime that they did not commit. Um, so that's a, a, another big one. The another is just is faulty forensics, right? The use of uh, forensic evidence in a non-scientifically defensible way. So when we see statements on the record that you know, this person was the only possible person to have committed this crime. These, this gun was the only, or this bullet or a shell casing was the only one that could have matched to this other gun to the exclusion of all other guns in the universe. Um, we have to really scrutinize uh, that evidence to, to make sure that the claims are defensible. Um, in many of those cases, we need experts to testify to um, the, the validity of the science that's being used. Um, and we have to make sure that we give our clients a voice, you know what I mean? And I say that as a former defender, um, and it sort of relates to uh, one of the other factors is ineffective, ineffective assistance of counsel. We have to be vigilant. Like, we can leave no stone unturned 
when it comes to investigating these cases, when it comes to speaking to our clients, um, when it comes to speaking to their family members, um, and, and speaking to all of the witnesses in the case. And the reason I say that is, the, and it depends upon what jurisdiction you're in and how uh, defenders are provided to people who need them, when they're provided to people who need them, there are obviously many procedures that happen before arraignment court, which happens to be um, when, when many defenders are um, provided to people who need them. We have identification procedures before there, and many other opportunities for um, investigators to speak to um, our clients. Uh, so I say all of this to say that anyone who is doing the work of criminal defense needs to have resources. They need to have access to um, investigators. They need to have an opportunity early and quickly to meet people who need them um, prior to arraignment court. And this is, you know, the public defender in me speaking now. Um, so ineffective assistance of counsel, I want to just sort of be clear that that does not always mean what we sort of think about it. We think of these attorneys who are just not, you know, doing what they need to do. Um, but in many instances, they don't have the resources or they have way too many cases uh, to, to handle appropriately. So those are a couple of other factors. I gotta simply say that each case is different and each case has it, its own unique circumstances that should be taken into account um, as well. Thank you. Now, as we mentioned before, Marvin Anderson is on the board of the Innocence Project. So tell us a little bit about your, your work and some of your passion as well. Wow. Well, I started off earlier when I was 18 years old, and Anton had mentioned that you know, I had dreams. Um, after I was exonerated, I did get a chance to go to the Fire Academy. And I completed Fire Academy, top of the class, and this is at the age of 36 now, okay, with 18-year-old kids. <laughs> um, I was able to complete the um, cl class training, and I ended up going back to the very same station that I started off when I was 13 years old. And within three or four years, I moved up the ranks, and then for the last, 15 years before I retired two years ago, I was the chief of that station. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, not only that, but from the time that I have been exonerated, I have been working with the Innocent Project, trying to make changes in our laws. Um, speaking to youth groups, um, just being on the board to help guide this project, it's been amazing. Um, like Anton mentioned, Barry, Shaq, Peter Newfield, they started this organization with just a dream. That's all it was. And it has grown. Um, not only in the United States, but overseas as well. So, when I have the opportunity to not only help the project itself better their ways, um, learn new ideas and, and make the changes in the justice system that we need, but it also gave me the opportunity to talk to you all, um, the public. What happened to me can happen to any one of you on any given day. I mean, I was a person that, that grew up trusting our law enforcement. I was taught to believe in them. They will protect me. They failed. Now, I still do believe in our justice system. I believe in our laws. We need to live by rules and regulations. Yes, everyone. But it's the people that enforce these rules and regulations I do not trust anymore. So, I'm trying to change that as well. Yeah. Can, can I add to that um, speaking with Mr. Anderson and to many of the people that we have worked with over the years, over the 30 years who have been exonerated, 
is a huge help to attorneys like me uh, who come to this work at a different stage. I was a public defender. Um, and, you know, I, I referenced that I work in a smaller part, department at the Innocence Project that does um, amicus briefs and we do a lot of trainings and um, other work around the country. So I actually don't work as much with exonerees um, on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and, you know, chatting with Mr. Anderson and uh, many of the resilient people who have been exonerated help fire me up. It gives me the passion that I need to do this work every day. Um, it encourages me. Um, and it's, it gives me context, uh, and context that I'm happy to share with, you know, that we are sharing this with you all today, but it's certainly context that I wish I had as, you know, a 20-something, you know, public defender right out of law school. So it informs the work that we do, um, and uh, it, it helps guide us. So it is not to be taken lightly. Thank you so much, man. Yes. Anton Robinson, what are two criminal justice issues related to wrongful convictions that legislators should focus on in the coming year? It's election season if you haven't mm -hmm. opened your mailbox <laughs> or your phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, if one big one for me, and again, this is, um, this is not a, a broader institutional statement, but, you know, I every day work on cases involving eyewitness misidentification, uh, and there are no shortage of jurisdictions um, that have an opportunity, I'm thinking my words <laughs> here, um, to um, implement better practices um, when they're doing identification uh, procedures. So things like making sure that they're recorded or making sure that we know what happened in the identification procedure in the first place. There are many different um, things that an officer can do to get the best statement. You know, it's a, it's a really difficult time to get any information from a, a witness, frankly, um, and certainly the victim of, of, you know, any violent crime. But there are some best practices that can be implemented to ensure that we're getting the most reliable information. Uh, so, you know, any, any um, you know, legislation that is related to ensuring that we get real information um, and the most reliable information at the time of these identification procedures um, is one that is at the top of my list. Um, and then another, uh, and again, just Anton speaking, <laughs> is, um, involves false confessions. And to ensure, uh, and I'll just kind of suggest or, or put this out there, that, that when many officers are taking uh, statements from people, um, that they are allowed to lie, to not tell the truth. And so there's been some movement on uh, legislation uh, designed to ensure that officers d are not able to, to lie explicitly at the time that they are conducting uh, in, an interrogation or, conduct, or getting a statement. Um, and so those, you know, that is also very interesting to me as a former public defender, knowing that, that in those instances, many of the clients that I would ultimately inherit, they have already gone through that procedure. There's nothing that I could have done. Um, so there's, you know, there's that to ensure that we do away with some of these practices that are verifiably, um, you know, lead to or a higher instance of, of wrongful convictions. Um, so those, those are two. I, if we had more time, I could give you a few more, <laughs> but those are two um, off the top of my head. And so and, and going off of that, another point that I wanted to make, and I want to make sure we have some time to discuss this, a, an important element of this conversation, and one that I don't think we talk enough about, is mass media and the role that local and national uh, news outlets play in perpetuating stereotypes. What are your thoughts? 
Yes. So, <laughs> um, as again, and this goes a lot to to my identification work. One thing I wanted to say too, and and it is not for not that we brought up the race of the parties um, in Mr. Anderson's case. Um, there is a phenomenon in uh, in our society, but also it comes up in these cases called cross racial identifications or own race bias. And what that simply means is that we all are better at identifying people who look like us or who are of the same race as us um, than, than other folks. Well, as you can imagine, this comes up in a lot of cases, but I've read too many records in the past, you know, couple of years that have no mention of the race of the parties, that have, you know, nothing to, you know, like the, that record is not uh, recorded. Um, and so, I say all that to say that I'm doing research now on cross-racial identifications. Um, many of the cases that, that I handle involve uh, media, and so what often happens is the person, uh, you know, one of the complainants or their victims or their family members do their own independent research of a person prior to a lineup procedure, um, and then they, you know, if they turn on the news in many instances or pick up a newspaper, they'll see photos of young black men, oftentimes, who are accused of crimes. And it is very clear that they are being accused of a crime and very clear that someone thinks that they are the person who committed this crime. And what this does in a witness's mind is this, they're looking at a photo that they think is the person who has committed the crime, and oftentimes they go to police officers and say, hey, like, I think this is the person. Now, now Marvin said something really important earlier on that I want to stress. In their minds, this is 100% actual. And the reason that is important is not just to let complainants off the hook, like certainly that is a part of it, they, they believe this 100%, but the other reason is they make really, really good witnesses. Like they take the stand and they point to the person who did this and they are genuine and honest and it is not, you know, when I was a younger public defender, I was like, why are my witnesses, why are they always lying? Why are they making this up? And it is not a fabrication in their minds. Um, and so, you know, I, I do believe that the media contributes to images that we have of young black men and, and black people and people of color in our society, and we have to start naming that because it is so difficult when you are trying a case, when you're picking your jury, and we talked about the jury in Marvin's case, to get to the bottom of whether a person has bias if they are biased. And so I think we have to have a very honest conversation about bias, and certainly I think that the media contributes to many of the biases that we have um, for people, and we just have to start talking about it because it's so little that a defense attorney can do in trial to undo these very complicated issues that we deal with in our society every day, and, and again, so the, the media can do a lot um, to, to stop uh, sending out these images of people because it has real life implications and it certainly can lead, and in many of the cases that we look at, um, can lead to wrongful convictions. Thank you. I forgot to ask you, Marvin Anderson, what did you do on your first day coming home from prison? First day, um, I arrived at my grandmother's house. That's where my fa family gathered at. Um, you know, I, I get out the van. Um, they took the handcuffs, the shackles off me, and I stepped out of the van. And I saw my grandmother there. Um, she was blind at the time, but. I walked up to her, she grabbed my hands, and then she felt my face. And that's when the, the remainder of my family just surrounded me. Um, 
Of course, I was up all that day, that night, mm -hmm. and for the first time, I actually stayed up all night and watched the sun come up the next morning. And I said to myself, you are free. Mm -hmm. And like I said, while I was in, incarcerated, I saw the con sun come up every morning. But it, it was just, I was sitting on my grandmother's porch, watched the sun come up, and I said to myself, you are free. Thank you so much. Um, before we open up to the audience, I do want to introduce um, one of the founding members of the Innocent Center of Nevada. Her name is Lisa Rasmussen, and she can um, stand right up here at the mic. Um, the Innocent Center of Nevada launched last year. And so Lisa, can you just explain some of your top priorities locally as an organization? I can, and oh, wait, I don't know if this is on. Is it on? There you go. There we go. Okay. So um, I'm Lisa Rasmussen. I'm a criminal defense attorney here in Las Vegas and have been since 2000. Before I tell you about Innocence Center in Nevada, I need to give a quick shout out to the Innocence Project because I, it, I've also been the legislative chair for Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice for about close to 20 years. And most of the substantial progress that we've been able to make, which is really not nearly as big as we would like, um, has come with great support from the Innocence Project. There is a woman named Michelle Feldman who I worked with for years, and we worked on really trying to get all of the kinds of things we're talking about here tonight passed in Nevada. Um, we, we have yet to get progress on the eyewitness ID changes we wanted, unfortunately. Um, we have yet to get progress on, on things that would hopefully curtail government misconduct, um, having to do with discovery and required disclosures. We have yet to get all of the changes we want on recording interrogations and witness statements, but we have made a lot of progress. And most importantly, we got a bill passed in 2019 in the legislative session that allows a process for people who have non-DNA exoneration claims to be presented to a court. Yep. And we also got a bill passed in 2019 that allows for compensation from the state for those who, are, who have been exonerated. And there are about 13 people that it applied to retroactively and then it will apply in the future to other people who are exonerated. And those were huge, substantial changes in many ways, although not as much as we want, they were big. And these are the kinds of things when you hear, and I tell you this because it's an election cycle, when you hear about criminal justice reform, this is what we're talking about. This is exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> and so I, you know, I cannot thank the Innocence Project enough for their dedication. They, like Michelle Feldman, who I worked with, her title was State's Campaign Manager. And every other year when we were in legislative session here, for our 120 days, she was right there by my side, giving me model legislation, meeting with legislators with me. So these are critical things that they have done, not just in our state, but across the country. So that's that. This year, or last year actually, I and several others, including T Tony, who's here in the front row, who works at Mob Museum, <coughs> founded what we named the Innocent Center of Nevada. We did it because what was happening here on these exoneration cases was that about, uh, well, Rocky Mountain Innocence Center in Salt Lake was handling them. But about 60% of their caseload were Nevada cases. And they actually came to us and said, hey, can we get something going in Nevada? And so we formed a group, um, and, and we have uh, a retired Supreme Court justice on our board, our founding board, some criminal defense attorneys like me, and some other people from uh, different populations and, and different um, 
organizations in the community. And we formed, we decided to name it ICON, Innocent Center of Nevada. Mm -hmm. We got our 501c3 approval in May, mm -hmm. and so now we can actually start raising money. We haven't had a chance to do a whole lot yet, but we do have professors at the law school at UNLV who are looking forward to sending students to work with us. And we are hoping to get up and running in the next year or so, so that we can take some of the burden off Rocky Mountain Innocence Center. They've been very supportive of us. And we hope to one day grow up and become a network member of the Innocence Project, the Innocence Project. So that's a little bit about ICON. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left, and I do want to give a, a chance for any members in the audience to ask any questions. Um, so if you can want to just raise your hand, we have a mic here, and we'll, we'll hand it over to you. Hi, Mr. Anderson. I just want to commend you for coming out today and speaking. Very inspirational. And my question to you is, were you compensated at all by the state in which you were convicted, wrongfully convicted? Yes. Um. <laughs> Thank you. You can't file a lawsuit against the Commonwealth. So, what had to happen was I had to go and get a state representative mm -hmm. to submit a bill before the Senate to grant me compensation, compensation for the time that I spent then. One of the, Anton hasn't mentioned it, he didn't mention it earlier, but one of the things that we have been fighting for years is that um, these Commonwealth attorneys and these lawyers to be accountable for what they have done through some of these cases. So, not every state gives compensation to exonerees, and that's one of the things the Innocent Project has been fighting. Um, there's a few states that does, but a lot of states does not. And I also always try to tell people that a person that commit a real crime goes in, does his time, and comes home, he has more programs set up for him returning to society than a person that who has been exonerated and didn't do anything when they return home. So that's one of the things we're working on trying to get changed. So, but yes, I was compensated. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have a two-part question. Uh, did you know the real perpetrator? And if so, what was their relationship? <laughs> um, actually, I did not really know him. I had, I had met him. <clears throat> um, my little brother was playing basketball at the playground, and him and his friends, and he came over and bullied them and took their basketball. And I went, got the ball. And him and I had some words, you know, and that was the first time I had actually met him. Well, a few months later is when the crime happened, and um, everyone in the community knew it was him, um, but I paid the price for it. You can pass the mic. Oh, yeah. I'll make it really quickly. Um, pleasure to meet all of you guys. Um, when you were in prison, were there any injustices or any unwrongful doings to you while you were in prison? No. Um, remember I mentioned that switch? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for speaking today, both of you. Um, I. And, well, we're all on the mock trial team at UNLV, and I was just wondering because Innocence Projects like those are the ones um, that make me want to be a lawyer, so I was wondering how did you get involved mm -hmm. in the Innocence Project? Thank you, um, and congratulations on being on the mock trial team. 
Um, it was my many years of being a public defender. Um, that is when it was uh, the light switch moment for me where I, I said I want to always be working toward protecting people. Um, I want to always be doing something to uh, prevent people from going into the system. And it is, it was just because I've had the opportunity to speak with thousands of people who were charged with crimes, many of them not guilty, um, charged with crimes, and to see the way a system can dismiss people. And I looked at a big part of my job as being to give a voice to people that our society doesn't want to hear from in a system that they're required to hear from. They have a constitutional right to speak up if they want to and to have someone protect them. And I wanted to do that to the best of my ability um, as a public defender, which I did for uh, about eight, nine years. Um, and you know, had always known about the great work that the Innocence Project did and wanted to get there and uh, to protect people from being wrongfully convicted in the first place. But who I am and what the work that I do today, the way that I move, um, most of that comes from me trying to create more equity in this world. Um, and, and that is, so much of that is related to being a public defender. So I encourage you, after law school, be a public defender. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much again for being uh, here tonight. So uh, my name is Jordan, this is Kaylee. Um, we're both in the graduate program at UNLV, so I didn't realize we had so much UNLV representation. <laughs> um, but in regards to just thinking about research and, and future legislation, um, what stuck with me was the demographic makeup of the jury that you mentioned that decided your fate. Um, in regards to moving forward and looking into the future, what um, adjustments can be made in the jury selection process so that it's more representative of the people that they're supposed to be serving? You know, one thing that uh, we talked about earlier today is that there are many ways that people are being eliminated from serving on, on juries. So having prior contact with the criminal legal system, um, in some instances, if there um, are you know, financial burdens that people have not paid for, uh, many different things that we can do to ensure that people are not l eliminated um, outright and legally from serving on juries. You know, the other thing is that, and, and I hesitate to say what this looks like, because I think it depends upon where you are, um, and I also hate to just give this sort of a broad answer, but I was the public defender who stood up, and this is more of my time in, in Orlando, Florida, but I stood up in, in a court you know, where I was next to a young black man, and we were the only two black people in the courtroom. You know what I mean? The full jury panel is in there, everybody's there, we're sitting there ready to go. And, and so I hate to just broadly say we have to ensure you know, more equity, um, in, you know, on the bench and make sure that, that there are more judges who uh, represent a broader experience and certainly more people of color. Um, but we have to get real about how race impacts criminal cases. Mm -hmm. We cannot pick juries and not, in, in that circumstance, and not mention that race might have an impact on how you view this person sitting here on one of the most important days of their lives. Mm. Um, and we should do that fearlessly. Like there shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to be some like, you know, avant-garde, like going against the great defense attorney to say that this is a real issue. Cross-racial identifications are real. My client is a black person in our country and that is relevant. And so that is the broad part of it. I don't know exactly how to make that into a, a response, but it means that we, we really, really have to see more diversity 
um, in, you know, for any system actor and gatekeepers who are making very real decisions and important decisions about the evidence that comes into cases and how it is weighed. We have to have real conversations about who's doing that work, how they're doing that work, and how we make sure that they're doing that work uh, in a responsible way. Mm. There's a few questions over here. They've been raising their hand. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, just before I start, uh, I am a police officer from the UK. Um, and what you've talked about tonight, both of you, has really changed my outlook and quite inspiring, really, uh, which is going to have a, an immediate effect when I get home. Um, in reference to that, back in the UK, there's a law called the Police and Criminal, Ev Police and Criminal Evidence Act that, was, that came around in 1984, which dictates the way in which I work um, every single day. So the way in which I conduct interviews, the way, way in which everything's recorded, um, and other bits of legislation, as you've talked about, that um, prevent me or a witness um, uh, who I take a statement from, or a, or a victim, from lying in their statement, and it's mm -hmm. contempt of court. Um, why do you think it's taken, um, or it's taken such a long time for legislation and bills to make a big change in the US um, to prevent such really unfortunate circumstances? Um, and you know, when we consider other rights that the US has and the importance of amendments and stuff like that, why the, the, the right to a fair trial and the right to justice really should be more at the forefront? I'm definitely punting on that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I say that uh, jokingly, but also honestly, and that that is a question that I have long had. And for me to come up with some explicit answer to that wouldn't be fair. I, I have asked that question uh, as, you know, back to being 17 years old. Um, because of experiences that I've had at that time and throughout the work that I have done um, as, you know, a public defender uh, and here, you know, at the Innocence Project um, and also doing some criminal justice research. Uh, it is, it is, it just sort of loops back to the idea that we have real conversations to have um, about the way that we look at justice um, and you know, hopefully we, we keep that conversation going. Was that a good punt or not? <laughs> that was a political okay, question, thank you. right? <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> good evening. Oh, yeah, I think you, uh, did you? Yeah, One moment. I'm, I'm trying to, <laughs> every time there's a political question asked to me, I usually <laughs> get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest problem that our society have in the United States is, is that they do not want to admit when they are wrong. Mm. That is the biggest problem that we have in the United States. And when you have representatives that are in office that controls everything, refuse to make changes, so I, I'm going to leave it at that. I usually get in trouble when it comes to political questions. <laughs> Good evening. I uh, want to thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, Marvin, for coming out. My name is James Allen. And like you, I was convicted at a young age here in the state of Nevada. I received the death penalty at the age of 19. And unlike you, I can say the justice system helped me because I was guilty. I was a young man and I took an innocent life. And here I am today at the age of 62. I came home in 2008 and I was hearing about your story. And even though I'm guilty for taking an innocent person's life, and I, the justice system still helped me as a young man. They nurtured me from death row to now, and I'm out. I have a book on Amazon, and like you, I want to help the innocent. I want to go back in because there's a lot of men that are sitting on death row mm -hmm. that are innocent mm -hmm. right here in the state of Nevada. But I was given a chance, and I appreciate people like you coming and tell your story because they don't hear stories like mine, mm -hmm. people who are guilty who are still out here making a difference. 
And that's what I'm doing, sir, and I thank you. And thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Anton. Of course. Thank the Mob Museum for having this. Appreciate you. There's a question here. Yeah. I'm sorry, we poked the microphone a little. It's a, another question from the same family. But, um, Mr. Anderson, I'm really interested to understand um, how you may have tackled the fact that, despite that first overnight waiting for the dawn to come up and being so happy that you were free, you must have also been racked with lots of emotion of anger of what had happened to you, and how did you stop that eating away at you and perhaps destroying that first few years of your life while you coped with the anger of what had happened to you? Um, I mentioned earlier that I was, I was raised in a church, um, and I questioned my faith many times while I was incarcerated. Before I went in, I had a dream of becoming a professional farmer. And I knew I would come home one day, but I just didn't know when that would happen. And while I was incarcerated, I completed my education, went to college, um, took several trades. I'm a professional welder, certified uh, a mechanic. And, and carpenter. So these are things that I was doing to keep my mind sane, to keep moving forward, to not get caught up in what you can get caught up in inside a prison system. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the light switch. When my family didn't, or when they would come see me and leave, and I have to go back, when I turned that light switch off, it was for me to go in survival mode. Um, I had to constantly look over my shoulder, make sure nothing is going to happen to me. Um, one of my best friends that was inside with me, we watched each other back. He's a brother to me. And you have people that you can find that are true-hearted people. They may be incarcerated, but they are still human beings. They did not let the system change them. And not only this one that became a brother to me, um, I never asked him why he was there or what he did, and he never asked me. But we had that bond. Where years later, because of my case, his case got opened up as well. And he was released because of DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, today we still talk at least twice a week. We don't live no more than 10 minutes apart from each other. Wow. When you're inside, you have to choose. Do you want to remain there or are you, are you trying to go home? A lot of brothers and sisters get caught up in remaining there. And he, the gentleman in the back who just spoke, he probably can relate to this. You become a con. There's a difference between a jailer, a prison system, and a con. The con is going to stay there. That's the only life he knows. A jailer, he's in and out. He doesn't really know the prison system. But when you spend more than 15 years of your life inside, you have to choose. Do you want to stay there or do you want to go home? I chose to keep my mind moving forward. That's the only way I could survive. We're just going to do one question, one last question here. here. She's had um, her hand up. The, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have Thank you. Um, I'm a law professor of emeritus, and I ran the criminal appeals and post-conviction clinic at DePaul University in Chicago. And I just want to echo the importance and the contribution law students make and can make mm -hmm. to solving some of the problems we have. Um, the dedication of my students, the ability to take them to the 
to prison to meet their clients mm -hmm. and put a face and a person with that name and that number and get them to work under proper supervision brought so much legal uh, talent that others couldn't do, didn't have the time to do, public defender, et cetera, with the volume mm -hmm. of cases. Yeah. So the more law students we get involved in mm -hmm. this, as you indicated, Mr. Anderson, the better. Yes. And I'll just end it with a quick story, and that is one of my students who was black, we were in court, he, and this is the identification issue, sitting next to the black defendant, they asked the witness, will you point out the person who did it, and she pointed at my student. That's happened to me twice in my That's career. Right. So, yeah. my, student, uh, my student obviously saw his law career, everything going out the window, as you indicated. <laughs> I'm going to prison now. But fortunately, what this did is the state dropped the case. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was it. The state yeah. dropped the case, and our client went free. But law students are a key element in oh, this. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm one to always say, you know, the law students work at the Innocent Project. I mean, they spend some time, hours, and their heart and soul into reading these caseloads. And, and to read one case file, and you, you cannot just leave that office that day and don't take it home with you. You cannot. And for them to have that much strength to do that and to help fight to try to get someone out, it's, it's a, a mark. And I just, I want to add, uh, because it's come up a couple of times, the Innocence Project just, like, we work with so many amazing people and organizations and foundations and, uh, you know, uh, volunteer attorneys, other volunteers and social, we have amazing social workers. So I just want to say broadly that it really does take a village uh, for us to get anything accomplished. So I want to add that. Last question. Hi. Um, so I know you said you had DNA evidence at the trial. Was that tested at all by like blood typing before you were exonerated, or was it just collected and put away? My trial? Yes. Um, in 82, DNA wasn't actually really popular in, in the United States, so it wasn't around. Um, <clears throat> testing was done right around 2000 in my case, mm -hmm. is when they found the evidence to have testing done. And when it first was brought to Ms. Neufeld's attention, the state actually tried to block it, tried to block the Innocent Project from doing testing. And we had to go back to the circuit court to put in a motion to have this test done. And the Commonwealth attorney at that time, which was new, um, he agreed to do so. Uh, the judge at that time was aware of my case and the circumstances behind everything. He approved for the test to be done, and that's when we f actually found out that the DNA excluded me, but the marker hit John Otis Lincoln, the real perpetrator of my case. So. Thank you. We have run out of time. Actually, we're about 30 minutes late. <laughs> They're going to close the place down on us. But I <laughs> truly want to say thank you for each and every one of you for being here um, tonight to learn about this incredibly important um, issue that is impacting every community across the world. And so. I know there are a lot of law students in the audience, and I hope that this was inspirational for you, but I also hope that it was inspirational for um, really everyone else as well, because we can all do our part. And a special thank you to our two phenomenal panelists. Um, it is an honor to, to share this stage with you, Marvin Anderson and Anton Robinson. Thank you all. Thank you.